Ah, hello. My apologies. It helps if you turn the camera around, apparently. Um, I'm hoping that you can actually see me and hear me now. I've just had an argument with my computer. Um, good evening, everybody. I have no idea how Facebook Live works properly, so please forgive me. Um, I'm Debbie Connolly. I'd like to welcome the Inner Circle members and say good evening to all of you. Uh, I'm here this evening to talk about the law, how it affects dogs. Um, you can see me. Hello, Alex. I didn't know you were in this group. Nice to see you too. Um, I'm ably assisted by cats over my shoulder. So any uh, mistakes I make, please forgive me. Um, I'm here to talk about the role of a behaviourist, a dog behaviourist in the law, tell you a little bit about the law and to talk about um, any questions you might have about dogs and the law and how it might affect your future or current work. Um, the work is a bit different to being a behaviourist. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, my role, my history first of all. You can, I believe, add questions in the comments and I will certainly at the end pause and if you have any questions at that point, please do um, ask them. You can interrupt as we're going along or save them for the end, that's up to you. So for those who haven't, uh, who are just joining us, good evening and welcome in Circle members. Um, I'm Debbie Connolly, I am a dog behaviourist of uh, sadly more than 30 years experience and I'm also a dog expert witness for the courts. I am a member of the Pet Professional Guild of Force Free Trainers. Uh, I also work with cats, hence uh, the ones behind me is my elderly and, and slightly mad cat who may join and help us. So <clears throat> some of you will be familiar with the Dangerous Dogs Act. It appeared in 1991 and has had a few updates that are very relevant since then. The Dangerous Dogs Act is often quoted all over Facebook and is often misquoted and completely and utterly misunderstood. Um, hello, Mary. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I want to talk to you about the law, the misconceptions, the things that people frequently get wrong. Uh, Facebook is the source of all knowledge and Facebook is very much um, the reason why sometimes things go wrong. So the Dangerous Dogs Act was created in 1991 and it was actually um, put together with the assistance of people like uh, Roger Mugford, who some of you may know, and also the uh, RSPCA played a part in it. And it came into being after some rather high profile attacks. Um, those of you who are as old as me may well remember. I'm not looking at you, Alex, I'm just saying. So the Act was created in theory to protect people from the uh, attack dogs, fighting dogs, whatever people wanted to call them at the time. And the, the pit bull was, was very much the uh, weapon of choice and described as being the devil dog at that time. The problem with that was it demonised initially what was thought to be a breed, but subsequently became what we call type. The law, in theory, should be something that protects the public from dangerous dogs, but most of us feel it's the owners, in most cases, who are far more dangerous, and you probably meet some of those in your working life. The difficulty with the law is people misunderstand it, people get... Um, get it wrong. It's very easy to break the law. So let's have a little look at what the law is about. Section one and section three of the Dangerous Dogs Act are the ones that you will see and hear about the most. These are the ones that are um, the important ones and they're the ones that you'll see the most. 
One of the crucial things is that in 2014, there was an update to the Dangerous Dogs Act. Prior to that, the law only applied in public. May 2014, it added private places and there are still people who are a little bit confused as to whether it is a criminal offence if your dog injures somebody in a private place. It is. When that amendment came in, a lot more cases were brought before the courts, and not just because of the private thing, but but prior to that, if your dog injured or hurt somebody in a private place, you had to take out a civil prosecution, and most people wouldn't. Once it became a criminal offence, we get some malicious um, conversations, some malicious reports, uh, and the law is, is certainly confusing. So what's the Act all about? It is a law of strict liability and reverse burden of proof. What that means out there is that the the law says that if your dog injures somebody, and it's injures, not bites, if your dog injures somebody, then an offence has been caused. It's, it's under Section 3, and it is an aggravated offence of a dog dangerously out of control. What people often get wrong is that there is an offence committed... Um, prior to that, if your dog behaves in a way that suggests that it might injure somebody. So if your dog's running about barking at people or chases people or even is barking in excitement, if the person who witnesses that can legitimately say, I thought your dog was going to injure me, you might be in trouble and that might be an offence. The aggravated version is as soon as there is injury caused. And this is an important point to understand. If your dog injures somebody, that could be the dog ran up to them, jumped up in excitement and pushed them over. Didn't bite them, didn't even try to bite them, but they could be injured. They could have a scrape or a bump or a bruise and an offence has still been committed. So you need to make sure with the people that you're working with and yourselves, of course, as dog owners, that when you are dealing with your dog out and about in public, that you are very careful that your dog doesn't cause any offence to anybody. In reality, when the police are faced with these non-aggravated reports where somebody says, I thought that dog was going to bite me, very few of those go any further. Most of them are a quick chat, a bit of a telling off in some cases, and they don't go any further. However, a few do. So make sure that when you're out and about with your dogs that they're not indiscriminately charging up to people, up to dogs, up to other animals. We've all been out and about. I've got dogs myself and we've all been out and about and discovered that somebody else's dog, even if ours is on a lead and under control, is coming racing over to us and causing a problem. It's something that I wish the law addressed a little more strongly, but as things stand, it doesn't particularly. Be careful. Strict liability means that if your dog injures somebody, you are pretty much guaranteed to have to plead guilty. It doesn't matter if there's a big sign on your gate that says, warning, beware. It doesn't matter if somebody comes up to you and says, can I stroke your dog? And you say no. If they then touch your dog or interact with your dog and your dog injures them, you are still liable in law. Warning people is not considered a defence. If your dog is out and about and somebody comes up, my advice is move your dog behind you, stand in the way, be rude if you have to. Alex knows me, he knows that that's probably exactly what I would do, and protect your dog. But if you stand there with your dog and the person can still reach it, even if you've said my dog's nervous, it's a rescue, it's struggling, it doesn't want to talk to you. If they can reach your dog and touch it and they're injured, you are still guilty and you are still liable. So make sure that you're clear about that. Signs are not a get out either. It's no point in in putting signs on your dog or on you. Um, In court a few times, it's been mentioned that a dog was wearing a vest of some sort, nervous, um, frightened, Alex is saying that he would do the same and be rude. He wouldn't because he's far too polite. Um, In reality, things that the dog is wearing, caution, I've seen, give me space, I'm training, those do not absolve you from the law. So be clear about that. Uh, They do help 
but there's been arguments in court that somebody has to come too close to read them. What if the victim can't read? What if it's a child? What if it's a person whose first language isn't English? So I'm not suggesting for one minute that you don't use them. People find them quite good, but please don't rely on them for any version of protection for you or your dog because it doesn't work like that. If you are out and about with your dog and your dog is not safe around other people or if it just runs about and runs up indiscriminately, please keep it on a lead. It's an argument in law if two dogs have an altercation, which one was on or off the lead, which one ran to the other dog. And you've all seen cases all over the news and Facebook of incidents where somebody was bitten because their dog got into an altercation with another dog and the owner of the other dog interfered and intervened and ended up being hurt themselves. So please be careful when you are out and about. Reverse burden of proof means, unlike a lot of other laws, you are guilty until you can prove your dog isn't dangerous. The law is considered to have already proven its case because your dog's injured somebody. So when we go to court for these cases, the defence of these incidents is based on bringing people like me into it. Um, if your dog is seized by the police <clears throat> because there's been an allegation that your dog has injured somebody, it will be held in kennels. You won't know where the dog is and you can't see the dog. The only other person that can get access to your dog once that happens is an accepted expert like me. Um, those of us who are accepted as being at experts for the defence and the prosecution, we can get access to the dog and we assess it and come to see you and your home in order to produce a full evidence report and come to give evidence in court on behalf of you and your dog. That expert report can make a big difference in what the court does, what action it takes, um, how your dog gets out of it. So please understand when you're dealing with these things that your defence, if anything happens, is based on expert evidence and you can bring other things if you've got nice pictures of your dog doing normal things. To get away from the snapshot of the moment of the incident, if you've got good pictures, letters of support from people who visit you, who come to your home, particularly if there are children involved, those things become crucial to mitigating what the offence is. So understand that the law says it is strict liability and reverse burden of proof. If your dog injures somebody or behaves in a way that suggests it might injure somebody, then you may well be guilty of an offence. The police may seize your dog, they may hold the dog in kennels and they may keep it there until a court date and let a court decide. There is one crucial thing I want to say here, which is the issue of the police disclaimer. Quite often the police turn up on your doorstep. Everybody's upset. It can sometimes be two, three, four weeks after the actual incident happened. The police turn up on your doorstep, often mob-handed, and they will want to come in and talk to you and see your dog. They may or may not have a warrant at that point. I've seen a few cases where dog owners were persuaded, bullied, pushed, suggested into signing the police disclaimer. That document gives the police ownership of your dog. You must not sign it and you must be very clear with all of your customers out there that should they ever be in that situation, they must never sign the police disclaimer. There is no legal reason or obligation to do so, but they are sometimes led to believe that perhaps um, somebody is, uh, they're going to end up in court and get a criminal record. They might. It might be that they're led to believe that there's no point in defending it. Not true. They, it may be suggested to them that, um, that the, the court's only going to destroy the dog anyway. Not true. So advise owners, advise your clients, know yourself that should you be in an incident and the police, hello Janet, thank you for joining us, um, should the police come to your door and suggest that you're in trouble with your dog and please make sure that you never sign the disclaimer and you talk to experts like me and you get legal advice, please don't listen to um, the Facebook experts, most of them have problems, um, they've certainly caused problems. 
The, um, the other thing to think about is section one. Now, this is the band breeds, which always gets everybody quite upset. There are four band breeds, the best known of which is, of course, the Pitbull Terrier. This is a really important fact. If you've never been involved or dealt with this before, you need to understand that the law says Pitbull type. Type is essentially a description of the characteristics and the measurements that make a dog a pit bull. And the law says a dog has to have a substantial number of characteristics. That sort of makes no sense because there's no definition in law of what substantial means. If your dog is seized by the police as potentially being a pit bull type dog and they measure it and it has some of the measurements and truthfully quite a lot of dogs will have, a decision is made how many percent the dog has and that determines whether it's going to go to court for there to be an argument over whether the dog is pit bull type. You cannot bring DNA evidence. You, um, yes, Alex has mentioned in Lennox, he's, he's sadly one of many, many, many cases. You can bring only your own expert to measure the dog and argue with the police as to whether their percentage and your own expert's percentage are indeed correct. That becomes a battle of experts in court on a lot of occasions. But the, if the police say, we measured your dog, we think it has a substantial number, you can get your own expert to come and see the dog and measure it. And if they agree, game over. If they don't agree, there will be an argument in court as to which expert is right. Because there is no definition of the word substantial, it's a bit of a silly description, but that's all we have. It doesn't matter what DNA says. It doesn't matter what your vet says. It doesn't matter what you bought it as or what the man down the road says. It wouldn't even matter if it had KC registration papers. The only thing that determines whether a dog is a pit bull type dog are those measurements and characteristics. It is defendable. The fact that the court may agree and say it is does not mean a death sentence to your dog as long as you are a fit and proper owner. The sad death of some dogs under that law is not because of the dogs themselves. It's to do with the fact that the law says these dogs cannot be sold, given away, exchanged, anything. So if somebody is the owner of a pit bull type dog and they perhaps have a history of violence, lots of uh, arguing with the police, not turning up for court, not respecting the law the dog itself could be in serious trouble and destroyed simply because the owner is not fit and proper. And unfortunately, that is the law that we live with. So if you're dealing with any customers or you have a dog yourself that might be type, then make sure that it is neutered, it is microchipped, it is insured, and then should there ever be a challenge, you've done most of the things already to prove to the police and the court that you are a responsible owner. Being accused of owning a dog that is a banned breed, if you are a responsible owner, and it's not a question of you've got one thing on your criminal record and suddenly you're not fit and proper, it really doesn't happen like that. But if you are ever accused of owning a dog that could be a type, dog or, or one of the other band breeds defend it always defend these things and never ever ever sign the disclaimer and sign your dog over to the police get help get some information experts solicitors out there will all help you and give you free advice if you're struggling pass this on to your clients and make sure that your clients are protected there's lots of myths go on. Um, you know, uh, if somebody comes past and I say, don't touch my dog, and they do, I can do, I can say, well, not my fault. No, you can't. It's not a defence. Um, if somebody, if your dog runs over to somebody and it frightens them and they smack it or kick it or push it away and they get bitten, still not a defence. So if anybody has any questions, please ask them. But I'm trying to... I'm trying to, I suppose, frighten everybody in some respects because I live and breathe this all day, every day. Um, sadly, in some cases, I've got to them too late. Somebody rings me and says, I was frightened. Somebody came to my door this morning. I signed the disclaimer. I didn't know what I was doing. I've just discovered I didn't have to. 
In most cases, I will go straight on the phone and I will chase the police involved. And in some cases, sadly, it's been too late. In a few, the dog's been saved. But in some cases, it's already too late. The person was frightened, didn't understand, felt bullied or pushed by the police and signed it anyway. I'm campaigning for some changes to this. Mainly, that's one of the issues. I believe that there should be a compulsory cooling off period of at least three days. Some forces actually do this unofficially and will not destroy a dog immediately. But many, as soon as you've signed that form, the dog never even makes it to the kennels. It is destroyed from the vehicle on the way from leaving your home. So I do think it's an important part of the law that really should be changed so that there's a cooling off period to allow people to go and get some advice because this is usually something that happens in the in the owner's home when everybody's distressed and the police police are there to take the dog away and everybody is understandably upset and worried and sometimes doesn't even understand what they've signed i do think it's an important factor i don't know how many of you watched the efra committee um, and the Environment, Farming, Rural Affairs. Um, DEFRA is the department of that. Um, the, sorry, I'm just reading Alex's question. Um, Alex is asking an important question here. Um, a question that he's often asked is the yellow dog, about the yellow dog campaign. The question being, if you put a yellow ribbon on your dog, are you accepting liability that your dog might be dangerous? Possibly, yes. Um, it is, it's something that, as I said, that's come up in a few cases. Uh, first of all, the ribbon itself, uh, I'm told a yellow ribbon signifies all sorts of campaigns. And in principle, I don't think enough people know that it is. I think the problem arises if somebody puts a vest on the dog or a lead that says nervous, I need space. What I've seen I remember standing in the park once with a client whose dog had a yellow vest saying nervous and a lead that said the same thing. And a lady and her child walked over and I pushed in the way and said, what are you doing? And she said, oh, I thought that was a guide dog. Now, that is actually not anything to do with um, with the law as such but it could be that you've almost invited somebody to come over it is not something that absolves you thank you for your question holly i'll come back to that in a moment it is a good question um i think the putting those things on does not absolve you only physically removing and keeping people away from your dog is sufficient defense are you admitting liability it could be argued that you put those things on your dog, knew that your dog might bite somebody. It's possible. It's not strict liability, but certainly I've seen it used in court. You only put those things on your dog because you knew your dog would bite somebody if they came up and you were trying to keep people away from your dog. Why wasn't it muzzled? That argument's actually been made in court. So be aware I'm not suggesting people don't use them. People tend to feel a bit more confident, but that's another problem. I, I've I've had a, a, a private client uh, towards the end of last year whose dog had a nervous, I'm in training, please give me space sort of things on the dog. And she's actually started to go closer to people herself because she said, well, other people will keep out of my way more now. No, you're liable for your dog, not other people. Um, Holly's asking a question about GoPro cameras. Big thing now. Everybody seems to have cameras. Um, her question is, would it be admissible evidence if you have told them not to come to your dog and taken uh, steps to try and keep your dog safe in public? Um, or again, would it be a case of, sorry, but you, I'll just have to read that, but you still, your dog still went for them. The simple fact is, um, it would, you'd still be liable. It doesn't matter if you say to somebody, don't touch my dog. Unless you physically move away, move your dog away, you are still liable. It is not an argument to say, well, I told them. Um, I told them not to touch my dog. I told them to keep away from my dog. It's not an argument. It can't be used as part of your defence. The cameras can be quite useful and certainly I'm seeing them a little bit more in evidence now uh, from the dog owners, not just from the police for a change. But I, I am seeing these things and um, it has helped in terms of 
somebody arguing about how many times they were bitten. Um, I know we don't really want to think about this, but let's be realistic. Um, I've seen one case where the camera showed that um, the person did, was warned not to touch the dog. Um, court said, that's the law, it's not a defence. But um, in terms of his version of the person, the, the, the dog the dog's owner threatening them with the dog effectively using the dog as a weapon it did prove that that didn't happen it did prove that the things that he claimed the dog owner said didn't happen so i'm not suggesting again that you shouldn't use them and they can be useful but the fact remains if your dog bites or injures somebody you are you are pretty much guilty 99% of the time and warning somebody not to touch your dog and then having it happen no that's not a defense I'm just checking if there's any question I've missed. Let me just scroll back. Um, do any of you use um, uh, leads and information? I'm just reading Janet's question. Um, I use the no dogs collar and harness as mine can be dog aggressive. Occasionally, so this is right. Uh, Janet is just saying she uses um, the no dogs. I've seen those as well. Um, again, I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't use them. But what I'm saying is... If your dog subsequently injures somebody, then you're still liable. It is still your fault. The, the law expects you to remove your dog and yourself, if, because that's normally part of it. But the law expects you to remove your dog from any scenario where there could be a problem, or at the very least to muzzle it. But bear in mind, the law says injury, not just bite. And I have had a case last year where somebody was badly bruised by a dog that was wearing a muzzle, came marching up to start an argument with the man who owned the dog, who tried to get away with his dog. His dog was muzzled because of a, of a previous uh, incident at his home. Lovely dog, assessed like a dream. I had no issues with saying that the dog itself wasn't dangerous in court, but... The, it still got taken to court, even though there couldn't possibly have been a bite, but it was because the dog leapt at this person who it, it, it appeared to think the man was threatening its owner, which in fact it was. Um, and in the course of that, the man got a very slight scratch from the dog's foot and, and a bruise from being hit by the muzzled head. Um, still injuries and still guilty, I'm afraid. From what I hear from people who do use all of these items, they generally find that there is a slight improvement um, in people not interacting or not bringing dogs or not coming closer. And, and the more that you can do to um, avoid situations, I personally think the better. I think that's, that's, that's why I'm saying I'm not suggesting don't use them. Just don't rely on them as some form of defence because they really aren't. But if you find that other people react better to you and your dog, which might be nervous or have been mistreated or be a rescue, just be careful. Um, I'm just reading Holly's comment here. Yes, Holly's saying that they use the dogs in training um, vests, I assume you mean, um, uh, Holly, the, the vest with it written on. Um, nervous with foster dogs. Worrying that a dog can be taken to court even if muzzled, yes, because the law says injury. It is another important point in this to understand that although a muzzle generally would mitigate a lot of what may happen to the person or the dog, um, the law says injury. I had a case of a muzzled uh, English Bull Terrier a couple of years ago who was quite boisterous and he jumped up at a lady, absolutely sociable dog, but just not under sufficient control or trained properly. And he jumped up at a lady passing and she fell over and broke her arm. And that dog was already muzzled and assessed like a dream, but still guilty because the dog did injure the person. It's a case of being aware that other people may not interpret your dog's behaviour the same as you do. Um, we always have a problem with other dogs running up to us. And it frustrates me personally. That not, this isn't a professional comment, but it frustrates me personally when I've got my dog on a lead, uh, particularly if my dog is one of my ex-police dogs who perhaps can be challenging sometimes. And other people and dogs, particularly other dogs, come running over. I wrote an article called um, It's Okay, He's Friendly. And, and all of you dog people out there, 
will probably be laughing along with me um, because that happens to us all the time. Some The interpretation of that, or the translation rather, is it's okay, he's friendly, means I have no recall on my dog and it won't come back if I ask it. So you've just got to put up with it. And it infuriates me. I've had dogs dancing around barking and owners saying, um, oh, it's all right, it's just playing. No, it's it's not acceptable to let your dog do that. And most people who shout that and do that actually have no control over their dog at all. And it's something that I wish the law did address better because the number of times that there are incidents because somebody's dog has run up to somebody else or their dog minding their own business is unbelievable. And the number of secondary bites, which is where the dogs are squabbling and one or both of the owners is injured in that, is absolutely astronomical. So please, please be be careful. Be careful out there. Hill Street Blues, if you're as old as me. Um, be careful out there, people. Um understand it's easy to break the law understand that there is a defense but it is not a defense just to say don't touch my dog and they do the gopro cameras i'm kind of pretty much uh, a fan of those um there are too many cases where there's been altercations and the other person has run away and that infuriates me at least stand there, stay there, deal with the consequences. So being able to identify somebody, it's the one thing Facebook is good at, is finding people. So it can be a useful way of finding who the other person is who's absconded from the scene. Um, Alex is saying, my dog is a husky. Yes, I know that. She's beautiful. Um, and he hates it when other dogs rush into his dog's face. Um, and a rapper who may not want to say hello to every dog. We don't want to say hello to every person that we meet. Um, I do find it infuriating and there needs to be more laws. Um, uh, yes, uh, Leanne, um, muscles are not always a bad thing and I wish I could get this across to more people. I absolutely agree with this. Sometimes people put pictures on Facebook and they've muzzled their dog because it may not like dogs or cats or it might scavenge for food. And they are then criticised for having muzzled their dog. It's a responsible thing to do as long as it's a basket type. So the dog can breathe, it can pant, it can be sick, it can drink water. So long as it's a sensible basket muzzle that it can exercise in, there is nothing wrong with muzzling your dog. Rather that than cause a problem. Um, yes, Alex is saying Arapaho is saying hello to me. I hope Miss Chief is well as well. Uh, I haven't seen them for a while, but uh, they are both beautiful dogs and always very well behaved. Um, so muzzle's not a bad thing. Um, whether you use leads, harnesses, whatever, not shock and prong. Uh, we're not going there because they shouldn't be used. Um, but use sensible equipment that means that you've physically got control of your dog. Double-ended leads, harnesses, combinations of um, harnesses, head collars, whatever. Make sure that your dog is, is ideally under proper control and that you could honestly say, I did everything I could. But as has already been pointed out, if there's a problem, walk away. Move you and move your dog to safety. Your dog only has you. And Alex has probably heard me say this before, but I would rather go home having been rude to everybody that I've met, but go home safely with my dog than be standing there debating whether I should say something to somebody who's interacting poorly with my dog and end up losing my dog. It's not going to happen. You don't necessarily have to be as rude as I am, but please defend your dogs. It's important. Um, Alex is saying he always gets his clients to, to muzzle to muzzle train their dogs um corn game absolutely uh i wrote um a new leaflet fairly recently which i've been giving out which has um, a section on muzzle training uh the reason that i wrote the leaflet was to do with treating stress in seized dogs when they come home however lovely it is to be home a lot of them can be quite stressed and some of them are suddenly having to wear a muzzle for the first time so i've described in the leaflet ways of muzzle training make it fun make Make it interesting. Let them examine it. Throw it on the floor. Make it a toy. Cover it in things that they can lick and eat. It's as positive as possible, ideally. Um, I'm just reading uh, what uh, Leanne is saying. Uh, people starting to be fined for dogs being on long leads lines. This concerns me. Um, 
I did see a story a couple of days ago about a lady who was, uh, I think, successfully fined for having her dog on a long lead. The reason for that is there was a local bylaw introduced, um, because I did look at this, there was a local bylaw uh, introduced, and um, the bylaw, I think, said that they had to be on leads of no longer than, say, two metres. And I think she was using an extending lead and the dog technically then was in breach of the bylaw. Um, if it's true that they didn't just go up and tell her off first, that's probably a bit overkill. Uh, I find, though, that some people, if you do approach them and try to help them, become quite abusive. So maybe that happened as well. Um, it's to do with the bylaw. The only other reason that you are fixed on a length of lead is because the court said so, because your your dog has been to court and the court has said you can't have a lead longer than X. And that can be anything from three feet to 10 feet. It depends on the circumstances. So be careful of local bylaws uh, is on that one. Um, <coughs> excuse me holly's asking a good question and i want to answer this because it's really important um if a foster or dog walker doesn't muzzle a dog when we have asked to muzzle or they have let off lead when told not to are they liable as the person in charge or are the rescue or owner as well this is a really important point um i've had several cases of this the first thing i will say is those of you who are rescuing and dogs are going out to foster you had better have a very good contract in place and you had better have the right insurance. It is important when a dog goes out to foster that the restrictions that you want and the rules that you want are not just handed to the fosterer but are signed for as accepted and understood. This can be a crucial point. So if you are employing a dog walker and I've had, I think, three prosecutions on dog walkers just in the last three or four months. If you employ a dog walker, they should be properly insured, show you that they are insured, and there should be a written contract between you and the dog walker. The law in principle says the person in charge of the dog at the time of the offence is the person who will be prosecuted. That person is usually the dog walker or the fosterer. However, the secondary charge, which can be used of uh, a charge against the owner as well, isn't often used, but it can be. And the rescue would be classed as the owner of the dog. So if you, for example, let's look at a few simple examples. You have a dog um, who, <laughs> I'll answer your question in a minute, Alex, because it's a good question. <laughs> the answer's not very much. Um, the um, so let's look at some examples. You 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 say to your dog walker, my dog needs to wear a muzzle and it can't go off lead. You can you can only use a long line or or this extended lead, and it must not happen. The dog walker could waltz off, let your dog off the lead with or without a muzzle, and this has happened in a case of mine quite recently. And somebody is bitten. The dog walker initially it was indeed prosecuted. Um, the owner was very nearly prosecuted alongside the dog walker because she couldn't prove what she'd said to the dog walker. She eventually, luckily, found, uh, I can't remember if it was a text or an email now, but she found some correspondence anyway. And because of that, um, they decided not to bother um, prosecuting her as well. And, and uh, sadly, the dog's now on a control order and has to wear a muzzle and a lead in public anyway, but a shorter one than he did before. Um, the frustrating part of that is the dog walker was insured but had no contracts in place. So trying to uh, trying to prove that you've passed on these instructions is difficult. So if you are a rescue, if you are employing a dog walker, please make sure that you've got proper contracts in place. Make sure that the person who is fostering or walking your dog actually has some insurance in place. It can it can make quite a difference as to whether uh, it's only a matter of time before a rescue is also prosecuted. Um, I have an ongoing case that I can't discuss, but if the person who um, is supposedly running this rescue isn't prosecuted as well, I'll be gobsmacked. Um, their level of responsibility is poor. An unassessed dog going into a foster home, um, sadly, the dog ends up biting somebody and the fosterer is being prosecuted uh, when the dog had problems wasn't the truth wasn't told but nobody can prove that um so make sure you've got contracts in place the person in charge of the dog is normally 
the person who is charged. There is an option to charge the owner as well. And sometimes that does happen. So although that's not common, protect yourselves. Make sure that things are in writing. I see a lot of rescues who just send an odd email uh, and say, oh, well, you know, um, uh, make sure you keep this dog muzzled. Our rules are this, our rules are that. They should be in writing and signed for. They're not legally binding unless that's the case. Don't rely on waltzing into court with a couple of printed emails and saying, well, we told her not to do that, or him. I keep saying her, could be a man. Um, make sure that all of your dogs and yourselves are protected, those of you doing rescue out there. Paper trail, always a good paper trail. Um, I hold, apart from my third party uh, public liability insurance, I also hold care, custody and control of dogs insurance. That is something that rescues should really have. Uh, it's come to light in a couple of cases where the owner of a dog involved in one of my cases couldn't keep it, or let's say shouldn't keep it in some cases, um, needed to be rehomed. And rescues that stepped forward... Um, were turned away by me and the police in quite large numbers because they didn't have proper contracts or the contracts were rubbish or in the main because they had no insurance at all. Please make sure if you're being a responsible rescue, you should have the right insurance in place. Um, it may surprise you to know that two of those turned down and I won't say which breeds they were, were fairly well-known breed rescues who only had public liability insurance for being at a show and having a stand. They had they didn't have any public liability insurance that covered them in general and the dogs, and they had no care, custody and control of dogs insurance, leaving the fosterers at risk as well. It's an important thing to understand that if a fosterer is injured by a dog that you can't prove that you've assessed properly, then you may indeed be prosecuted as a rescue. If you can't prove that a mistake was made by the fosterer. If you can't prove that you properly assessed a dog before it went out and have written records of that, you could be in trouble. So please bear that in mind as well. Um, I can see that um, uh, Janet is replying to Alex saying the cone game is awesome for muzzle training. I agree. If you're not sure what that is, I'm sure Alex can um, later describe that to you and uh, give you some tips on that um, as I said I've got a leaflet about it's actually for um, based on seized dogs coming home after being in kennels for a long time but the advice um, not just the muzzle bit but about how to deal with stress in dogs has been very useful I've had a few rescues request copies of it and they're using the bits about how to use Adaptil how to use Pet Remedy, um, how to use L-tryptophan, um, um, Zilkine type products, how to, how to how and where to use those to minimise the stress of a dog in a new environment. And that applies whether it's the dog coming back from the police or a dog going into a new foster or a new home when it's rescued. So the, the leaflets, if anybody wants that, contact me. I'll happily post them out. Um, I've had requests from vets and rescues and... Uh, various other people um there are some on my um i have a facebook page my dog has bitten and there are some um decent jpegs of the leaflets on there if anybody wants them um alex send me your address i'll happily post you some um, if you want to have a read of it first as i said if you go to my dog has bitten there is uh there are two on there that i've put proper decent jpegs of uh, one is the seized dogs for happier homecomings and the other one is dogs and children and it is not the usual advice about how to keep dog kids safe it is very much to do with um how you prepare a dog what sort of things can you do prior to children joining that dog's life to help the dog adapt um, and some sensible safety advice as well. So both of those leaflets uh, have pretty good copies on the My Dog Has Bitten page. Thank you, Alex. Please do. Um, they are available to be posted to you. Um, Thank you for that, Leanne. Uh, Leanne's just put up the uh, link to the My Dog Has Bitten page. Um, if you get a chance to read through there, I do put some of the cases on there. Uh, you will see that the last case posted is within the last week. It's a, a large bull breed, um, not typed by the police. It's a, an American Bulldog type dog. Um, 
you will see the comment that the dog was uh, disclaimed actually at court. It was disclaimed and will be rehomed uh, with the help of the police and myself. Um, I can't go into why, but uh, the family were keen for the owner to, because of his sad personal difficulties, uh, the dog would have ended up destroyed by the court had it not been uh, disclaimed so that we could find it a new home. They won't have any further recourse to the dog, but it saved the dog. Um, luckily, in this case, the police were very helpful. They worked with me and we asked the court for permission to do that and they were happy to allow that. Uh, you'll see a few others. You'll see a few... Um, all sorts of breeds. I had a bit of a run on German Shepherds, my beloved German Shepherds for a while for some strange reason. Um, and then a few collies. It's a bit like the buses. I don't see breeds for ages and then two or three come along at once. So the last thought I want to say really is the Dangerous Dogs Act, Section 3, applies to every dog, every type, every crossbreed, every single dog in the country can fall foul of Section 3. Any dog can behave in a manner that suggests it might injure somebody and then any dog can injure somebody. If you have a dog you suspect might be a pit bull type or one of the other banned breeds, then if you want to contact police and ask them, you can. But in, in the main, you can't be sure until there's a challenge made at some point. I've known people who are so worried that um, I've gone with them and referred them through the police and the dog's been measured and quite a few turned out not to be. Uh, a few turned out to be uh, pit bull types uh, and were put through the courts and successfully what we call exempted. An exempted pit bull is the only legal pit bull type dog you can own. It doesn't matter if somebody neuters it, insures it, muzzles it in public and keeps it on a lead. That does not make a pit bull type dog legal. It has to go through the court system to be legal. It's another bit of a, a, a fallacy that tends to go around Facebook quite often. Um, people saying, oh, uh, no, it's fine. My, my, it's, it's a pit bull, but it's okay because I muzzle it in public. It's always on a lead. Uh, it's been neutered. It's not. The only way to legally own a pit bull type dog is to uh, own a dog that's been through the courts and been exempted by the courts. And it's then subject to a few other conditions. Um, I'm just going to double check the time because I've rabbited on um, ooh, quite a lot, uh, probably less than usual, uh, those of you who know me. Um, I've really appreciated this tonight. I hope that uh, I hope I've offered you something that you didn't know already and that uh, is helpful to you. Um, I wish the Inner Circle well and I hope that you all uh, are very successful in your endeavours in the world of dogs out there. Um, if anybody has any questions that you think of later or you want to uh, ask any questions on Facebook, uh, I'm Debbie Connolly. You can go to the My Dog Has Bitten page. You can talk to me. Um, I'm uh, not known for suffering fools, but if you ask me a question, you will get the truth and you will get the answer. So my best wishes to all of you. Success in the future. Thank you for inviting me, Leanne. And <laughs> Alex says, interesting content, but very scary. I think he means me, not the content. Um, thank you very much, everybody. And um, if you want to do this again sometime, um, please ask. Thank you and good night, everybody. I will do, Alex. I will pop and see you. Thank you, everybody. And good night.